This morning's scripture is found in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45 on page number 846 and 847 on the Bibles on your chairs. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Nice to see you guys. My name is Stephen Coppenrath. If you haven't met me yet, I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Foothill Church. And uh, before we jump in uh, to the book of Mark this morning, uh, I'd like for you guys just to bow your heads and pray with me. God, I thank you for this opportunity uh, we have each weekend to to open your word, to talk about how it applies to our lives. And and God, I pray that uh, as we look at this passage here in Mark chapter 10, that uh, we, would, uh, we would see the point in which you're trying to, to give to us, God, that we would see how, how serving uh, makes such a big impact in our lives as we do it and in, as, as our community as, as they uh, reap the benefits of it, God. So help us, God, as we look at your word. Um, give us eyes to see. Um, give us uh, the understanding to how to apply it as well. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, my, uh, my wife and I have two kids um, one is named Owen, and he's, uh, he's about two, uh, a little over two. And then the other one, um, her name is Penny. Uh, she's uh, a little over five months old. And so uh, right now, Penny is kind of at this place where she pretty much just sleeps and eats and poops a lot, and um, she will smile from time to time, which is super cute. But, um, and from what I understand, uh, girls pretty much just get more complicated from this point. And so I'm kind of actually enjoying this time, this little window of time we have right now um, to hang out with Penny. Uh, on, on the other end, Owen, Owen is, is uh, like a lot of kids, there's kind of this huge disconnect with Owen between what he hears and what he understands, right? There's kind of this, this big, big uh, space where, where he, he hears me, right? Ever since he was a baby, he's heard what we've told him. Um, he's heard the things that we've said. He turns his head. He smiles. He kind of nods sometimes. He, he hears us, but now the trick for us is this whole idea of understanding and, and trying to get him information so he understands it. Because I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've told Owen to clean up his blocks, right? To say please, to say thank you, to stop sitting on Penny's head, right? That's not cool. Um, to, to hold your cup with two hands. Um, lately, the thing has been, uh, Owen, stay in bed. Just stay in bed. I don't, it doesn't matter if you have to go to the bathroom, stay in bed for now. Um, and, and so just telling him over and over and over again, and, and again, there's this disconnect between him hearing me and him understanding. Now, this principle goes both ways as well, right? He, he'll talk all the time. Um, if you know my son, he talks all the time. He says lots of things. Sometimes it's very clear, right? Sometimes he looks at me and says, you know, Daddy, come sit here, please. 
And it's like, cool, I understand what he wants, and so I'll sit there. He'll talk to Katie. It's very clear sometimes. He'll, he'll bend down low, talk to, to Penny, and he whispers, you know, whatever he's whispering to her. Um, other times, it's, it's very much, stop uh, the choo-choo. And it's like, what are you saying, kid? Like, out of all the Asians in our family, you're the only one that speaks Korean, right? Like, I don't, I don't know what you're trying to say to me. Um, and again, so the issue isn't hearing, it's understanding. And now to understand what I'm talking about, you don't have to have kids, right? You don't even have to want to have kids. All you have to do is watch kids and how they interact. And there's this disconnect between hearing and understanding. And I think that it doesn't just end there. Um, this happens with us as adults as well. A lot of times we'll have a conversation um, with a friend or a family member or maybe our kids or, or whatever, and we think that the information is getting relayed very clearly. We think, well, they understand my expectations. They understand what I want them to do. And only to find out later that uh, it wasn't so clear and expectations weren't quite met the way that we thought. And, and so depending on how important the information is, those kind of situations can be incredibly frustrating. And we've all been there. We all understand that. And so this is what happens here with the disciples in Mark over and over and over again. If you guys have been hanging with us through Mark, um, Jesus is trying to explain clearly, and he does it clearly, what is expected for the life of a Christian here in Mark. This is what you can expect. This is what discipleship looks like. And, and he says it clearly over and over again. He's not talking in riddles. He's not talking in parables. He's not doing the whole, you know, there was once a man walking through his farm and he found a seed. Or He's not doing that. He's speaking clearly and concisely about what the cost of discipleship is. And so this morning, what I'd like to do with our time together is I actually want to start in Mark chapter 8. And so go ahead and turn just maybe a page over, Mark chapter 8, and I want to look at a prequel to our main passage in Mark 8, and uh, we've looked at this a, a few weeks ago, and so we'll start Mark 8, then we'll head to Mark 10, look at our main passage, read through that together, and then as soon as we've done that, uh, I want to give you just three principles when it comes to understanding discipleship, okay? So let's go back to Mark 8, verse 27. Verse 27, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, who's, as we know, he's always kind of the first person to speak up, he, he says very confidently and very accurately uh, this great confession of faith. He says, you are the Christ. This is who you are. And remember, when Peter says this, uh, Christ isn't Jesus' last name, right? People don't just know him as, oh, that's, that's Jesus Christ. He's walking around. Uh, Christ means Messiah. Christ means deliverer. Christ is, is the one who the Jews have been promised for a thousand years. And so when Peter makes this confession of faith, he's saying, Jesus, you're the guy. You're the one who we've been waiting for. And he makes this great confession of faith. Uh, verse 30. And Jesus strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this, help me out, he said this plainly, right? He said this plainly. Don't miss that. Uh, it's not like he used a bunch of cryptic phrases or, or analogies. He said plainly, this is going to happen. This is what you can expect. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be mocked, tortured, killed. At three days, I'll rise again. And he says this clearly. He says it clearly. Verse 32. 32. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus, turning and seeing his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And so we talked about this, but Peter doesn't get it. He doesn't quite get it yet. Uh, he doesn't understand what he's talking about. And so what he tries to do, he says, look, son of God, come here. You know, let's, let's have a conversation because what you're talking about, it does not line up with my understanding of what the Messiah looks like. 
And so he's trying to inform the son of God, look, I have a better plan in mind. And so, uh, so Jesus, kind of loud enough for everyone to hear, he, kind of in the stage whisper, he says, get behind me, Satan, and kind of just nails Peter. And if you've read the Bible a little bit, you don't feel too bad because Peter kind of had it coming, right? Um, Peter kind of is always this guy that is just speaking up first. And, and so he says, get behind me, Satan, for, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but rather the things of man. And he says, Peter, you need to have a perspective shift. Verse 34, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And then uh, Jesus continues just to lay out what is expected um, and, and the high price, the great reward of discipleship. He just kind of lays it out. When it comes to following me, this is what you can expect. And so this is the prequel. And, and now as we look uh, just a, a page over, maybe chapter 10, um, we're, we're gonna see, see kind of the extension of the story. Just to catch us up, as we heard last week, a man called, the Bible calls him the rich young ruler had just come to Jesus. He came to Jesus asking him a question, kind of the question, basically saying, what must I do to be saved? And if you can kind of just imagine the disciples' perspective as they're hearing this man talk and kind of interact with Jesus, they have to be just chomping at the bit. They're like, oh man, this guy is politically connected. He's got money. He wants to join our group. This is awesome. And so Jesus, kind of understanding this, he, he, he takes this idea and flips it on its head almost immediately. And he says, well, look, buddy, for you, because of your heart condition, because what you love most, uh, I, I want you to give away everything that you have. I want to sell, sell all your possessions. That's what you have to do to follow me in, in this time. And so as we know, the, the rich young ruler walks away sadly. And so can, can you just imagine what the disciples are thinking here? I mean, man, Jesus, you just blew it, right? That was like our number one finance guy. He was going to finance the whole, the whole thing. You just blew the building fund, really. I mean, we could have had upgrades. We could have gone to a 15-passenger van instead of just walking around. Like, it could have been all these great things. What are you doing here? And, and so Jesus begins to explain again here in, in uh, chapter 10, starting in verse 32, what true discipleship looks like. So let's, uh, let's look at that. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Again, just happened with the rich young ruler. They just had this interaction. They're thinking, man, I gave up my livelihood. I gave up my business. I left my family to follow this guy around, and he's making crazy decisions. I, I don't get it. And taking the 12 again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. Now, again, remember, he's, he's communicating this clearly. He says it clearly. He, he, he doesn't beat around the bush. And from what we can tell, the disciples understand, at least they're hearing what he's saying. Um, but look what James and John do. This is interesting. <clears throat> Verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. <clears throat> Which is interesting. He, to start off a conversation with Jesus this way. Um, we want you to do whatever we want you to do. And, and so Jesus says, he plays along. He said, I'll play ball. He says, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. And so Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism of which I'm baptized? And they said to him, we are able. Now, we hear this um, this language just a little bit later in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus talks about, uh, he, he's, he's, he's sitting there, he's kneeling, praying to God the Father, and he's saying, take this cup from me, uh, but not what I will, but what you will. And he's talking about suffering. 
He's talking about this, this suffering that he's gonna have to endure. It's the same thing with the baptism imagery. When he says, can you be baptized with the same baptism I'm about to be, he's not talking about you know, bringing back John the Baptist from the dead and rounding up the guys and saying, okay, all, all the disciples need to be baptized before following me. He's not talking about the, the physical act. He's talking about this, the root meaning of baptism. And, and very much so the, the first part of that is being immersed underwater in a, a, a symbol of our death and then later we're brought back up as a, a symbol of our, our new life in Christ. But the, book, the, the, the point here is, is the, the Bible looks very differently at suffering than we do, than the disciples do. It's kind of a whole different mentality. In Philippians 3, you don't have to turn there, but it says Paul here is talking about the mature believer. He's talking about um, how a mature believer, it's actually a position to be desired that we wanna suffer. And Paul says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. This is Paul's perspective on suffering. And it's very different from you and I. It's very different from the disciples because he desires to suffer. He sees that through suffering, he becomes more like Christ. He sees that through suffering, he gets to understand a portion of Christ's mentality. And we, we also know that in James chapter one, that through suffering, a, a believer becomes more mature, more complete, lacking in nothing. And so this is how the Bible views suffering. It's very different than, than what we do. And so Jesus is saying to James and John, can you drink this cup? Can, can you handle this? And, and basically, they, they turn to him kind of overconfidently, a little bit ignorant, saying, yeah, we can do that. That uh, shouldn't be a problem. And Jesus, probably smiling to himself, very matter-of-factly says, well, you will drink my cup. And history tells us that James, James is actually the first apostle to be martyred for his faith. That, that John, later on in his life, he gets captured and they actually try to boil him in a vat of oil. It doesn't take, but these guys are going to understand suffering at some point. And Jesus knows this. He knows what's coming. Verse 39. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. So back to James and John's kind of original question, their original request here. You understand what just happened. Uh, Jesus just lays out that he's gonna be betrayed and beaten up and tortured and killed and all, all these terrible things. And these guys go, oh, okay, all right, can, can I come? Is that cool? Uh, it, it reminds me kind of of, I'm not sure if you guys have ever had this happen to you. Um, you're walking along and someone says, oh, hey, how you doing? And I say, oh, not so good. And they're like, okay, great, I'll see you later. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. These guys completely miss it. It's like that a thousand fold. Jesus just laid out the horror that was before him. And, and the, the guys just basically want to know, hey, when you're king, can we sit by you? Is that cool? Because I'm not sure if there's like reserved seating or anything, but I'd like to put my name in there. Just completely missing it. Uh, verse 41. This is the disciples' response. Uh, when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. Okay, a couple things here. If you've read your Bible, you know not to give the disciples too much credit, all right? Looking at their track record, the fact that they're indignant here, it's not like they're saying, oh, the arrogance of, you know, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. I just can't believe they'd ask that. That's so embarrassing. If we look back at their track record, they're probably upset that they didn't call shotgun first, right? They're probably ticked off like, oh, I didn't even think about that. What's also interesting here is this word indignant. Um, look back at, at verse 14. Verse 14, this, this section about the children. We talked about this a few weeks ago. And it gives us a glimpse, a, a little bit of a window in what gets Jesus fired up. If you ever want to know what gets Jesus upset, this is it. If you recall, Jesus is doing ministry. He's had a busy day. He's, he's doing a, a lot of stuff. And toward, it's, it's, the end, it's towards the end of the day. And his disciples are, are kind of, Noticing Jesus is slowing down, he's getting tired, and so they start to slow up the crowd that comes to him. 
And part of that crowd are these children, a bunch of kids that want to see Jesus. It's this really interesting passage. And so if you look at verse 14, it says this, but when Jesus saw what the disciples were doing, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And so for me, looking at verse 14, this shows how off base the disciples were, right? This shows, this because Jesus is upset, He's indignant, upset the disciples. Instead of, of escorting the kids to Jesus, they're playing security. And, and so we see that Jesus is upset here. He's fired up. And then looking back at verse 41, our passage this morning, guess what? The disciples are indignant. It's the same exact word. And it just kind of shows me here that, that the disciples, they get upset about very different things than Jesus does. Um, and... and it's kind of, it kind of reminds me of this, this idea that, you know, whatever you get angry about, what gets you upset, what gets you, you know, fired up and angry, that's usually the thing that you care most about. And so for, for us, looking at this passage, the disciples have a very different idea of what, what's worth getting angry about. They're upset for selfish reasons. And so all this brings us this morning to the heart of what I want to talk about. Um, if you look at verse 42, let's keep reading. You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and whoever will be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to serve, but to be, cannot to, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, so you kind of see this progression of greatness. Jesus lays this out very clearly for us. You guys just don't get it. Look, if you want to be great, if you want to be great, then you have to serve. If you want to take it to the next level and just want to be the best of the great, then you have to be a slave. If you want to go all the way, and if you want to be like me, then you have to lay your life down as a ransom for many. And so Jesus lays this out. And so what I want to do with the rest of our time uh, this morning is uh, we, we've just read through the passage. We've seen what's happened here. And, and for us, just to fir first off, I, I wanna get some judgmentalness out of our system. So uh, can we all just kind of shake our heads judgmentally at the disciples? Just, just join me in that, back and forth. Those silly disciples. Well, I mean, what are they thinking, right? Their response is amazing. It, it's amazing because you look at verse, um, chapter eight. Chapter 9, chapter 10, 1, 2, 3. There's all these, these conversations the disciples have over and over again. And they still just don't get it. They don't understand it. And, and just as I'm about to, you know, get on their case, the Holy Spirit comes and he reminds me, man, things haven't changed much. Things have not changed much, have they? And just even looking at my own life, man, I've had the opportunity to grow up in some great churches. I went to AP, went to chapel. I've been at some great churches. I've, I've worked at churches. And how many times have I heard spiritual truths over and over and over again? How many times have we heard things that make a lot of sense? They're from the Bible. We understand they're supposed to be things we, we, we live out, and we just don't get it. And so the, the issue for the disciples is very much the same issue that you and I have. It's the same issue my son has. It's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to understand it. There has to be both. We have to hear it and we have to understand it. And this is the issue that, that we want to talk about this morning. So when understanding discipleship, Three things I want you guys to write down. If you're linear in your thinking, you can go ahead and write down one, two, three ahead of time. I'll give you permission. Uh, understanding discipleship. Number one, heaven comes later. Number one is this, heaven comes later. So if you look back at James and John's original request, right, in verse 37, they said, hey, grant us to sit at your right hand and your left hand when you're in glory. James and John have the wrong perspective Right? They're, they're jumping the gun a little bit. They, they have this idea that, hey, let's talk about this now when there's so much still that has to happen. And you see, if we're honest, if we're honest with our own lives, we can think this is heaven too. We think that our lives is, is, is heaven-like. Heaven like uh, All it takes is a great lunch at the beach, a great conversation with a friend, 
right? I mean, a great day with the family, a day at Disneyland with like no lines, and it's like, this is great. You know, life's pretty good. And you start thinking, hey, this is, this is probably what heaven will be like. And so we have these ideas, but, but I also know that, that that's, that's obviously off. We, we have to realize that, that heaven comes later. But we have this mixed up sometimes, and I know that because we complain. Uh, I hear people complain, I complain, and we say things like, God, why did this happen? Right? Well, why, why is this happening in the world? And we complain about things that don't happen in heaven, but do happen in a sinful, fallen world. And so we're talking about things like death and genocide and dying and these natural disasters that just wipe out communities. And a lot of us have these questions like, why, why did this happen? Well, what's the plan here? Well, why, why is this happening right now? And it, it reveals for us that, man, the fact that we're surprised by it, it reveals that we very much think that this could be heaven. And we have to remember heaven comes later because those things happen in a sinful fallen world. Uh, you see, our problem, our society's problem among many is a simple concept, two words, instant gratification, right? We want it now. We want to experience it now, right? We want that vacation now. We want the car now. It doesn't matter if I, it'd be better to save up and buy it in cash. We'll, we'll buy it on credit. We want it now. Um, we, we kind of give Pastor Chris a, a hard time uh, sometimes because I feel like he's like the last person in the Glendora area without a flat screen TV. And, and he always talks about it. He's like, oh, I'd love to get a flat screen. I'm like, you should just buy one, dude. And he's like, no, I'll just wait till it gets a little bit cheaper. And, and, you know, most people don't have that mentality. Most people are like, I want the flat screen. I'm going to buy it right now. No problem. Some of us have multiple flat screen TVs. And, and this is our problem. We, we want it now. And the story of Jesus, on the other hand, the story of Jesus is all, all about, he, he's like the ultimate example of delayed gratification. And if you look at the Gospels, if you look at the story of his life, you see that he came not to be served, but to serve. What type of king comes to a new place to, to, to serve people? It just doesn't make sense. He could have blown it all up the first time. He could have crushed the Romans. He could have been that guy that everybody wanted him to be. He had every right to do that. He was God. He was God. He, he had the power to create universes and planets and the whole deal, but he came with an eternal mindset. He came in a gracious step towards mankind, and he was born as a poor kid in a stable. He was born at eight pounds, six ounce, baby Jesus, right? He, he, was, he came, and, and the Jews are thinking, oh, this is the Messiah? Okay, this is awesome. The Jews, Jews are thinking, okay, they're going to crush the Roman Empire. He's going to be the one that unites all the people, set everything straight. Let's get this going. We're excited. Let's, let's do this, Jesus. And, and the disciples are, are thinking it. And if we read our Bibles, we can kind of see the progression as well. We, we can kind of see, oh, wow, he's starting off as a, at a humble beginning. It's kind of rising up. And it's kind of the story, the plot of a great movie or something. And, and very similarly, we're, we're sitting there with our popcorn, like, oh, when's this going to happen? It's going to be awesome. It's kind of like uh, William Wallace before he becomes Braveheart. You guys remember the beginning of the movie? He's like, oh, I just want to, you know, raise crops and, you know, raise a family, God willing. And like the next scene, he's like stabbing someone in the throat with an antler or something. And it's like, oh, that's awesome. And we're, we're kind of waiting for that moment with Jesus. It's like, when's the blue paint coming out? Because we want a Jesus that, that gives it to us right now. And, and so we're, we're thinking, when's it coming? When's it coming? And you see, guys, we have to remember heaven comes later. Heaven comes later. The first time Jesus came, he came to serve. He came to, to serve his disciples, to serve mankind. And it definitely comes... One day, Jesus will come back all tattooed up. He'll have fire in the eyes, a sword out of his mouth. We're promised that in Revelation. But until this point, he, he washed Peter's feet, right? Knowing full well that, that Peter would, would betray him. We, he, he washes Judas's feet, knowing full well that he's going to sell him out for some pocket change. And so this was Jesus' uh, his example for us. The one guy that could have come and just demanded it all, he did exactly the opposite. And he was this great example for you and I. This is what service looks like. This is what slavery looks like when you don't have to do it. 
And he illustrates this for you and I. So we must wait. We must be patient. And Jesus himself talks about this. He talks about this idea of patience uh, when he talks about fasting. He says, when you fast, don't, don't wail in the streets and tear your clothes so everybody sees that guy's like, oh man, that guy is super spiritual. Wow, I'm really impressed by that guy. He's, he's fasting. Because if you do it, that's your reward right there. That comment, it's your reward. And so if you wanna do that, it's, it's fine, I suppose, but don't expect anything more than that. When he talks about tithing and giving your money, he says, do it in secret. Do it in a way where you're not boasting about it as opposed to, you know, maybe you're sitting in, in your row today. It's like when the, when the tithe bucket comes along, you don't stand up and say, I, Stephen Copperman, am now tithing. I would like for you all to know that. Please be impressed by me. I mean, he's saying if you do that, people will look at you funny, first of all, but if you do that, it's not a right or wrong thing. It's just, it's just stupid. It's like saying, do you want a candy bar right now or do you want a million dollars later? He's saying, look, there is so much in store for you. And so if you just have a little bit of an eternal mindset and you realize heaven comes later. Number two, when understanding discipleship, a valley doesn't mean a wrong turn. A valley doesn't mean a wrong turn. Here's what I mean by that. The Bible is pretty clear that when you follow God, when you follow God and, and just being in the center of God's will, it doesn't give you a free pass to have a perfect life, right? I mean, we, we, some of us know that very, very well, but in our lives, we usually kind of think that. We think that, oh, well, if God sent me here, then it's gonna be great, right? If God sent me to this job, then this must be a great job and I'm gonna experience joy and fulfillment here. If uh, God sent me to this area to live, then I'm gonna find friends and my neighbor's gonna be wonderful. The school's gonna be great. And, and guys, in Mark 8, Mark 9, Mark 10, Jesus just explained the cost of discipleship. When you follow me, when you follow me as, as a disciple, there is gonna be some suffering involved. It's promised to us. In verse 38, Jesus says, you do not know what you're asking. Um, the disciples aren't worried about that. I mean, if, if we're with Jesus, life's gonna be great, right? Have you guys ever met someone or maybe have someone in your life that you just feel like whenever you're around them, you kind of feel a little bit stronger, more invincible? Uh, when I was in high school, my youth pastor was like that. Uh, whenever we went down to Mexico, we went down there all the time, and we would do stupid things down there. And just the fact that he was in the bus with us, it's just like, oh, I guess it's going to be okay because he's here. And we played fireworks. We'd like do things all the time that just, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that today. But the fact that you're kind of just with this person, it, it raises your confidence. And the disciples kind of have this same mentality. It's like, I just want to be with Jesus. And if I'm with Jesus, things are going to work out fine. And, and so I think it's still common that we have uh, these type of requests uh, that James and John do. We're limited in our understanding. We're limited in our knowledge. And so we ask for things over and over again. And God's probably just sitting up there like, if I gave this to you, you would just, it would just ruin you. And we ask for, you know, I want to marry this person. I want this job. I want to move this place. And, you know, I have all these opinions and plans. And we have a limited understanding of, of God's will, obviously. And so, guys, Jesus can't be a means to an end. We can't use Jesus to have a comfortable life. We can't use Jesus to have a great job. That's not the point. The point is following Jesus, not the life that's associated with it. And so if you associate Jesus with a nonstop mountaintop experience, you're in for a shock. What happens when, when things don't work out? Who do you blame? Well, God brought me here. What the heck? Why is this happening? And I've had conversations with friends lately who used to be in the church, and now they're kind of coming back into the church. And through those conversations, I've realized that they're, growing up for me too, there was kind of this mentality that you just picked up along the way that if you do the right things, good things will happen. If you say the right things, then good things will happen. At best, that's just religion. And at worst, it's it, what it is, it's karma, right? And so if, if you have this mentality, I would encourage you to shift your perspective because what happens when mom and dad get divorced? What happens when Billy dies in a car accident? What happens when this girl that you really thought you were supposed to marry dumps you and marries your best friend? I mean, who do you blame at that point? What do you do with that? 
And everything that we've done, it, you start to realize, like, why am I doing this? And you find yourself in this valley, and it's like, what am I doing here? And that's usually the first question people ask is, you know, where's God? You know, how did I get to this point? Because people have a hard time. They wouldn't assume that God would ever lead them into a valley. Um, this is why Peter in Mark chapter 8 rebukes Jesus. Because they just have this great clarifying conversation, this great DTR, right, to find the relationship of like, look, you're, you're the Christ. I'm going to follow you. And then Jesus starts talking all about, I'm going to die, be tortured. And Peter's like, whoa, 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 hold on. This is not the way I'm seeing it because Peter had a hard time understanding that between where Jesus was and where Jesus would be in glory, that there'd be this valley in between, much less a sheer cliff of betrayal and death and the, the whole lot. And so this is how Peter responds. And, and so for us, just because you're in a valley, and maybe you're there this morning, it doesn't mean that God isn't directing your steps. Um, maybe it means you've made some bad choices, that's very possible, but it doesn't mean that God isn't there with you. Most likely, he wants to grow you. He wants to mature you. This is what he, he wants to see out of, out of believers. So number one, heaven comes later. Number two, a valley doesn't mean a wrong turn. And finally, number three, when understanding discipleship, we must remember that greatness is found in serving others. Greatness is found in serving others. Look back uh, with me at verse 43. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Uh, do you see what's happening here? Jesus just does something amazing here in verse 43. Jesus just redefined a word, which only really Jesus can do and like hip hop artists can do, okay? This is pretty amazing. He, he takes this idea of greatness that has been the, the pervasive school of thought for thousands and thousands of years, and we still have it today, this idea that greatness is basically being above average at your skill or craft or sport or job, right? You're, you're just above average. You're just way better than everyone else. In fact, you're so much above average that you'll just crush anyone who is average. And so uh, LeBron James is a great basketball player, because if we wanted to play him right now, just like, you know, everyone in this room against him, he'd probably win. He's just better than everyone. He's, a, he's the beast of a basketball player. And so he's so great. He's got this entourage of servants. He's got people that just want to hang out with him. He's got people that wash his car, do his laundry, just hang out with him. And this is what greatness means. It means you have servants that want to follow you around. They'll, they'll, cl they'll clean the house when you don't want to. Warren Buffett is considered great because he invests so well, right? I think the guy is worth $44 billion. Um, he's good at his job. He's a great at investing. And, and so he's so great that you got people that are constantly bombarding him, wanting to know his secrets, wanting to know his, the tricks of the trade, want to just hang out with him, trying to rub shoulders with him, trying to get an idea of well, why, how did you get where you are? And so he's got servants, right? His servants probably have servants. And when you, when you have $44 billion, you probably don't clean your own house, right? In fact, you, you might not have even been in all, your, all the rooms of your house. I mean, I, I don't know, but the guy just has wealth. And when you have wealth and when you have fame and you're successful like that, people will do anything to get around you, to rub shoulders with you, just to learn more about you. And that's kind of how it works in, in, the, in the world. People, people are wanting to be around that greatness, and so they'll serve you. And that's what it means to be great. Jesus, he flips it. It's amazing. Jesus flips this and says, look, greatness is not that you're so much better that you have servants. Greatness is that you serve. And it's, it's this transformational idea that to be great, you serve. And he just redefines the word. And he can do that because he's God. And he just says, look, in my dictionary, greatness is found in serving other people. The, the Bible makes this clear. Again, kind of going back to our original idea, it's not a problem of, of hearing it. We've heard this. It's, it's a, a problem with understanding it. When it comes to living it out, it's a little bit harder. Um, when it comes to serving people, it's a little harder. If any of you have ever put on an event, 
Um, you know what I'm talking about? Because uh, the momentum going into the event, everybody's excited about what's going to happen. And, and then after the event's over, everybody just splits, right? No one's there to help out, clean up. Um, maybe you've had that experience before. And everyone likes the idea of servant leadership. But the, the moment someone starts treating you like a servant, it's like, uh, I got better stuff to do. No matter how many books we read, it just goes against human nature. Ever since we were kids, we just didn't like the idea of someone else getting the big piece. And so we have this very human, very innate ability to observe, to keep score. We kind of know uh, what's happening and, and what's fair. And I mean, ever since you know, we were kids, it's like, well, he got a bigger piece than I did. And we remember that. And, and this is all driven by a great fear. And the great fear is this. The great fear is that I will be taken advantage of or I won't get what's owed to me. This is what we're concerned about. This is what we're worried about, about what's fair, what's owed to me. And so let me give you an example. Let's be really honest here um, in church just for a minute. Um, by, by a show of hands, how many of you have ever done a favor for someone and really just appreciated getting, you know, a thank you note or some kind of acknowledgement? How many of you guys have ever done that before? Just really appreciated the thank you note. Okay, great. Um, how many of you have ever done a favor or uh, served someone in some way and received no thank you note or no acknowledgement before? Okay, most of us. Okay, this is a little bit of a harder question um, sitting here at church. How many of you guys were kind of ticked off that you didn't receive that thank you note? Uh, how many of you guys are lying right now? Uh, most of you. You sit next to the people that you're like, I don't want them to know that. H here's what we have to remember. Jesus defines a servant as, as this. A servant is somebody who completes his task, who does his job. And, and the thing is, is that a servant, a true servant, will not expect a thank you. They won't expect a thank you because they're simply doing their job. And so a lot of us, we have this ideal in our brain of, of how servant-hearted we are, of how great we are, and how, how we're just willing to help people out but the very fact that you and I, and I do this too, that, that we remember who thanked us, who didn't thank us, the fact that we're tallying up these points in the back of our head, and we're thinking you know, it needs to even out at some point, right? I, I, I dropped their kids off for soccer. When's that gonna happen for me? Uh, we remember these things. And while we say that we're certain hearted, the fact is, is that well, we still need to grow in this area. And so this is the great fear, that we won't get what's owed to us. So if that's the great fear, here's the great reality. If we are in fact meeting the needs of people, if we are in fact living a lifestyle that where people's needs come first before our own, if we're actually doing this, here's what's actually happening. It's two things, the opposite of that great fear. Two things are happening. First of all, God will lift us up. God will lift us up. We don't need to turn there together, but just write down in your notes, uh, Philippians 2, 3 through 11. And you might know this passage. It says, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count yourselves more significant than others. Um, Paul is encouraging all of us to have the servant mindset. He says, look, be a servant. And he says, uh, have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. He is our ultimate example. And so he talks about how our ultimate example, how Jesus came down from heaven, became a baby, became a man, and went all the way to the cross to meet our, uh, meet our needs. And because of that, it's amazing, because of that, it says, therefore, he was highly exalted by the Father. It said that Jesus' name will be praised more than any other name throughout history because of the service. In other words, uh, I believe this principle, it, it, it's the same for us. If we serve, if we're serving other people, not only will God see it, but he will make sure that, that we're lifted up and that we're taken care of. So that's the first reality. The second reality is this. Number two, everyone will want you to succeed. Everyone will want you to win. Um, it, it's just true. If you go around giving everyone the first cut, and I'm not talking about extremes, okay? I'm not talking about giving away all your money and just living on the street. I'm not talking about every time you go to a baseball game, you have to wait and you're the last person out of the parking lot. That's, that's stupid. I, I'm, I'm talking about there's this bias in your heart 
that says, how can we win-win and how can I let you win just a little bit more? If you have that mentality, if you're looking out for the needs of others first, then not only will God lift you up, people will love you. Because who, who doesn't like having an unselfish person around? I mean, we all like to have that guy or girl around that just gives and just a great servant. Um, and, and so let me give you an example. Um, I want you guys to think for a moment, just what, what's your favorite store that you like to shop at? Okay, get that in your brain. Some of you guys are maybe having a hard time going one of 12 stores. Some of you are like, oh, that's AM, PM. What, what else is there, right? Um, so think of your favorite store that you like to shop at. Your favorite store, you got it? Okay, so here's my question for you. Why do you shop at this store? Is it because uh, you want the owner to get rich? You want the stock owners to make more money? No, probably not. Um, you shop there because it's convenient or because they have great quality, or because the value that you find at that store is better than other stores. It's because of the customer service. That's why you shop at these stores. And so Jesus is redefining greatness, and he says, look, even at a very human level, at a very selfish human level, we all have this, this ability to, we, we wanna help out and encourage those who help us. And so if you have customer service that's great, I'm probably gonna shop at your store, even if it means I have to pay a little bit more in prices. If you serve other people, people will love you. They'll encourage you. They'll lift you up. And not only that, God will do the same. And this is what we have to look forward to when we serve. And so just for us to review once again, the point isn't simply hearing truth, right? We hear it all the time. It's, it's understanding it. And so in understanding the life of, of a Christian, understanding discipleship, there's three things. Heaven comes later. We have to remember that there's an end goal that we can't even see yet. A valley doesn't mean a wrong turn. Just because you're in a tough place this morning, it doesn't mean God's not there with you. It doesn't mean that he, want, he doesn't wanna grow you and, and teach you something during this time. And finally, greatness is found in serving other people. And, and so as we kind of wrap up this passage at the end uh, in Mark 10, 45, at the end of the day, I, I, don't, I don't believe that merely hearing is enough. And actually, I don't think the understanding is our end point either. There has to be application. Because we can hear, we can understand, and if we don't do anything about it, then we're no better off. We have to apply it to our lives. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus talks about giving his life up as a ransom. And, and a lot of times when we hear verses like this, I feel like it's very, it's just like up here. It's very like pie in the sky, like kind of hypothetical. Like, yeah, I'd, I would do that. I'd give my life up as a ransom. I'd take a bullet for my kids, whatever that means, you know? Uh, I would serve people that way. But I think another element is this application part and how we serve on a day in and day out uh, process. How, how do we serve? And it's serving without expectation, right? It's serving without needing to get the thank you note. And so what does that look like? For me, it starts small. It starts at home. It starts, how, how can I serve my wife, Katie? How can I serve her when I wake up in the morning? And it goes to my kids, Owen and Penny. How, how, do, I, how do I serve them? And yeah, that's part of my job, but uh, we all know that we can serve kind of with a, a, some attitude as well. And so how do I serve them? How do I see their needs as more important than my own needs? Um, and then it goes out from there, our, our friends. How, how do we serve our friends, the people we hang out with? It goes into our community. How do you serve the, the barista that makes your coffee three or four times a week? I mean, do you even acknowledge them? Uh, how can we go out of our way and speak words of life to them, encourage them, even though they're serving us, how can we encourage them in some way? And it spreads out from our community to our, our neighborhood. And, and uh, just the other day, um, Katie went outside to grab um, grab something from the car, and she noticed that our, our neighbor, um, who, who to my understanding, he's not saved or anything, but he, he was watering this brown patch on my lawn. And she comes in, and she tells me, and I'm like, I feel awful. I'm embarrassed. I'm like, oh, that's, I'm supposed to be doing that, right? I'm supposed to be watering his lawn. And, and it could be something small like that. Are, are we watering each other's lawns? I mean, try it out. Maybe you got some funny looks, but so if we're going to be real practical, uh, it goes from our communities to even our workspaces. How do you serve 
uh, your boss? How do you serve those underneath you? How do you serve your colleagues? Do you look for opportunities or are you so concerned with making sure that I get mine? Making sure that I'm taken care of, that you don't even see that stuff. What does it look like at Foothill Church? Are you serving? We talk about this each week and, and it's important. Uh, are you serving here at church? And uh, you know, I can't answer that question for you, but if you look at the teachings of Jesus, what he tends to say is you, you want to pick the worst seat, not the best seat. You, you want the worst parking space, not the best parking space. You want to pick the worst service, not the best service. And, and so as we look at our lives and how we're making decisions, are, are we doing things where we're just talking a big game? Because Jesus says, beware of the guys that, that talk big, but really just want the seat of honor. He actually says, beware of the people who use their mouths to to spout off all these things that sound great, but when it comes down to it, when you look at their hearts, they really just want what's best for them. And, and so my hope for us as a church is that we would really begin to buy in um, to this idea of this redefinition of greatness, that we would see that uh, greatness isn't having the nicest stuff or the biggest paycheck or, or having the most authority. Greatness is found when the church serves. Are we serving one another? Are we serving our family? Are we serving our neighbors? This is how we know that we're great in the eyes of Jesus. It's dads who serve their kids. It's spouses who serve one another. Are, are we doing these things? And that our servant-heartedness that starts at home and it spills out into the streets of our neighborhood, into our community. It transforms the community. And it, again, it's not because we want to do it. We, we don't want to do it. It's not in our nation to want to do it. I mean, if it's raining outside, I don't want to park far away. I want to park close. Um, and, and so it's not because we have willpower or because we're moral or we're better than people. We serve because we have been given a new heart. We serve because Christ has given, given us a new mind, a new eyes to see the needs of the people. And so it, it, it's this understanding that if, if I don't do it, somebody else will. And so I will. I'll step up. I'll serve. This is my hope for our church. Uh, let's bow our heads and pray to that end. God, I thank you for this time this morning. And again, Lord, as, as we talk about um, hearing and understanding, God, I pray that this idea of, of being a servant, it would not be something that we simply just hear. God, I pray that there would be understanding. I pray that there'd be application. Uh, there are people in this room who have heard this sermon many times, but they've never done anything about it. And so God, I pray that as we leave this place, that we would find small ways to exercise our serving muscles and just start to, start to look for ways to serve people. Uh, maybe it's on the way out for lunch. And maybe it's later on interacting with, with friends or family. And God, just give us eyes to see opportunities that we might serve people the way that you served us. God, you are the ultimate example. And we thank you for uh, the fact that even though you didn't have to, you came and, and you were born in a humble circumstance and, and you showed us what it meant to serve. And so God, we want to follow in your footsteps and this is why we do it. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We pray this in your name. Amen.